Lisa. Yes, baby girl. When I grow up, I want to be a woman to society. And so shall you be. Hey, this is Lisa Landry. Welcome back to A Menace to Society. I have the great privilege today of speaking with Amanda Parker. She's back again to speak with us. She's the Senior Director of the AHA Foundation. Welcome back, Amanda. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm thrilled that you're back. I bet you've been super busy lately with all this child marriage nonsense that seems to be reasserting itself. Unfortunately, we have been super busy with it. It's it's something that is really rampant in the United States, and not many people realize that. Do you think it will be increasing? Because it seems like there's going to be some bans going into effect where young girls won't have certain choices available to them any longer, and their families might just marry them off to the guy who groomed and preyed on them, yeah? That is definitely a concern that we have at the AHA Foundation, We started working on child marriage in the first place because we were working on the issue of forced marriage. And we found more and more that we were having girls come to us facing forced marriages. And when we're working with with women, we have all of these resources available to us where, you know, we can access domestic violence shelters for them. We can help them get a, a pro bono attorney to help them with any legal needs that they have, like getting a divorce or or filing for an order of protection. And those resources in many cases are just not available to minors or they're so much harder to access. And so we started working on child marriage because we were like, why are we even dealing with this with minors in, in the U.S.? And the truth is that pregnant girls are definitely at an increased risk of forced marriage. If they're living with a family that sees pregnancy outside of wedlock to be shameful, absolutely they are at increased risk of a forced marriage. And the fact that there are fewer options available to pregnant girls and pregnant women, frankly, in the United States these days, or that that's the direction that things seem to be moving, is is certainly likely to have a negative impact on child marriage. I would imagine so. And I think a lot of these parents and probably grandparents, too, think they're doing the right thing by their family and by their beliefs, but they are putting these young women at significant risk. That's the truth, Lisa. And I think it's exactly right. You know, the parents and grandparents involved are thinking that they're doing what is best for their daughters and their, you know, their grandchildren. But the truth of the matter is that girls who marry, even pregnant girls, are much better off if they wait until they're 18 rather than getting married before they're 18. Truthfully, what they suffer from is something that I wouldn't have even thought about unless I was steeped into this issue in the first place. Girls in the United States, we're not talking about overseas, but right here in the United States, girls who marry before 19 are 50% more likely to drop out of high school. They're four times less likely to finish college. And because of those things, they are 31% more likely to live in poverty later in life, which makes sense. If you don't finish school, you're more likely to live in poverty. And following from that, right here in the United States, girls who marry before the age of 19 are have a 23% higher risk of heart attack, stroke, diabetes, cancer, all things that I would have never, ever associated with child marriage, but they are, and studies prove it right here in the United States. Globally, they're three times more likely to be beaten by their spouse. And the kicker, and this is awful, is that those marriages are almost always going to end in divorce. Between 70 to 80 percent of marriages of minors end in divorce. So we're looking at, at trying to help these girls who are pregnant. And what's happening is we are basically condemning them to a life of poverty and onset of disease that you wouldn't even think would be associated with child marriage, but it is. Okay, you know what, Amanda, people are going to hear you say that, and they're going to think you're full of shit, and they're not going to understand what you're saying, because learning about these childhood traumas and what they actually do to impact us negatively later, even in our physical health, that's a new thing. You know, I, I hear you, and we talk about this to tons of people all the time and to legislators and it really is eye-opening to them that there are all these negative consequences that go along with it but just think about it if you're a girl who is living with her parents and you're pregnant then your parents are likely to be there supporting you and encouraging you to go to school hopefully and it's going to be easier for you to go to school but if you move in with your new spouse and you're living with them, you're much more likely to drop out of school to be able to take care of the child and stay home. 
that's just how that goes. And so that, I mean, to me, it just is logical to understand why getting married makes you more likely to drop out of school. And, and all of those things that follow from that, the poverty and the disease are, are proven to be true here in the United States. And it seems crazy, but it's not. And girls who are pregnant have, I mean, all of these, these negative outcomes that are associated with child marriage impact her baby too. I mean, that poverty and that disease onset is not going to be something that's a positive for that unborn baby. Oh, I hear you loud and clear, but you know, some people are going to think, well, not this guy. He's a good guy. He's not going to do that to my daughter because he's from a good family. So this is going to work out. You know, it's not about the people who are involved. It's it's just about the fact that, I mean, statistics prove it. 70 to 80% of these marriages are going to end in divorce. It's not about whether he's a good guy or whether she's a good, you know, a good person. And it's also not even about maturity level, to be honest with you. Marriage is a serious legal contract. And along with that, come legal responsibilities and and as a minor you shouldn't be allowed to enter into that serious legal contract you're not even in many states allowed to file for your own divorce without the help of a guardian so we are essentially locking these girls into wedlock we really need to end the male guardianship system in america you know it's, <laughs> like, I'm so done with this shit I really am like I don't hate on men I love I love dudes my son is going to be a man one day God willing but this whole ownership it's just such a racket I'm just so done with it I'm with you Lisa I'm with you Lisa and we are also not not man haters at the AHA Foundation you know we're also supporting men and boys who are forced to marry and who are in child marriages but to be honest with you it's almost always girls who yeah. are yeah, child marriages. Yeah, totally. But also think about the men who have to be raised in this environment. Like if you're a little boy and your mother has no rights in the home and she can't feed you because she got into a child marriage and your daddy was beating the shit out of her in front of you. I mean, your life is pretty much like you said, you're going to be more on point for getting cancer and diabetes and heart risk and substance dependencies and all this other garbage because you Absolutely. weren't protected as a child. So it's actually a cycle that's messing up everything. That's exactly it. It's a cycle. And that's what people are talking about when they're talking about the cycle of violence and, and the cycle of poverty is that living in those circumstances and, and experiencing those circumstances as a child yourself, it is more likely that you're going to grow up and repeat those same behaviors. And that's exactly it. What's going on with the federal government recently coming out? I don't remember which agency because I'm not as intelligent as you, but somebody came out with some new statistic or some kind of proclamation that being married before the age of 18 is a human rights violation? It is absolutely a human rights violation. We should allow kids to be kids. They should go to school. They should be allowed an adolescence. They should be allowed that time to make mistakes and to learn and to understand themselves better. And forcing children to marry or even allowing them to marry is a human rights violation. And the fact that we say that, and this is something that the U.S. Department of State says is that child marriage is a human rights violation, but we allow it in the United States. Every single state except for two states, Delaware and New Jersey, allow for marriage below the age of 18 in the U.S. Okay, so our states are going against the federal government's decision about this issue. Absolutely, absolutely, and it really is up to the states to take action and to say we are not about violating human rights and we are going to stand up and and say that 18 is the minimum age to get married but it's a slow process and there's a huge learning curve to get from where we are to where we need to be lisa you would not believe the response that we get from lawmakers we hear i mean everybody of course has a great grandma who got married at 15 and and it was the love of her life and she was super happy until you know had a 60-year marriage to her husband but we also hear people say things like and this is, I'm not even kidding you, Mary and Joseph were minors, or Mary was a minor when she married Joseph. And so we should allow for children to marry in the United States. I mean, we just hear the craziest stuff. And I don't know what it is, but legislators in a lot of states seem to have this mental block with saying there's no reason below the age of 18 for someone to get married. They, they have a really hard time getting over that hurdle. And I'm hoping that the more we talk about it and the more we talk about the negative consequences that are associated and the fact that it can so easily be forced marriage is going to help them to get over that hurdle and to say, you know what, 
I've changed my mind. I realize this is actually really bad for kids. Well, you know what I think is maybe going on? We have people who, like you say, they they just don't know. They don't know any better, and they're in charge of laws. And I was noticing the Louisiana legislature recently passed a ban about a woman's right to choose, even you know, in cases of incest and rape. And one of the legislature, this is a woman, she's a representative, she's a CPA, like, you have a background in finance. You don't know anything about medical decisions or psychology or personal stories. How can you put this law into effect, especially as a woman? Yeah. Yeah. I honestly don't understand it. And it's it seems like, you know, we do get pushback from men legislators and from women legislators. You know, it's definitely not just the men who are pushing back against these no, child marriage laws that we're talking about. No, yeah. it's not. It's women It's women making these choices out of ignorance or maybe trying to be like the guys or maybe, you know, they can't make a decision outside of this because they need this guy for another issue that's going to come up on the floor. Yeah, that's true. That's true. There's always, like, backroom wheeling and dealing that, that gets in the way of... of putting good policy out there and, and that is really frustrating. How how can we make politics more transparent? What are your thoughts on that? I honestly think a first step is people need to care. You know, people need to get involved and pay attention. And politics are already a little bit more transparent than we realize in that we can go in and have a chat with our legislator. You know, it's so much easier than than most people would think to set up a meeting and talk to their own legislator and say, listen, this is what I care about. This is how I feel about it. And I you represent me and it's important to me that you're hearing my views on this. But also, I mean, I'm dealing with legislatures across the United States and I can't always be where I need to be or where I want to be and, and sitting in the room and listening to conversations. But when committees are meeting, they're generally posting video, live video online. So you can actually watch and see the conversations that legislators are having about issues you care about. So if there's a bill that you're following in your state, you can actually go and watch online as it's happening real time, what people are saying about it, what concerns they have about it. If your politician is actually doing what they say they're doing, you can't be in every room all the time, but you can certainly pay attention and and there is more accessibility than most people think. But then we'd have to stop viewing our porn online. (laughs) We'd have to prioritize our screen time. I don't think I never All knew that. Are, I never knew that you only, could just go online. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to over talk. Oh no, I was just gonna say there are there are only so many hours in the day we're gonna have to push our porn <laughs> watching to after the, the committee meeting that we wanna watch. So what are some states that are doing good things to protect kids? Well, right now, uh, we at the Alha Foundation are working with legislators in both Pennsylvania and Massachusetts. They both have really strong bills that there are legislators who are passionate about this issue that they're pushing forward. And Pennsylvania right now looks really, really strong. Massachusetts is pretty strong, but there are a little hiccups along the way. Hopefully we'll be able to overcome those. We were really, really hoping to see Nevada become the third state this year to ban all marriage before the age of 18 because they have the very first women majority legislature there. But unfortunately, at the very last minute, that didn't happen. And so our our hopes were crushed with Nevada a little bit. But Pennsylvania and Massachusetts are still going strong, and and we are really hopeful about both of those states. Well, you know what, Amanda? Um, I'm a resident of Nevada, and I would think that you getting that close is very significant because the marriage industry is huge. I totally agree with you, and that was something that we were really excited about. Even... Even getting this far along in the process sends a really strong message that the child marriage is is a human rights abuse. This is something that we should be thinking about. It's happening here in the United States. And you're absolutely right. The marriage industry is huge there. So that was a really big deal for us. Yeah, that's like a a winning back or how do you call it? Losing forward? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, exactly. So what's next? Where are you off to? Because I know you fly all around the country for the AHA Foundation. Next week, actually, I will be in Pennsylvania with our sister organization who is fighting the good fight on child marriage in the U.S., Unchained at Last, and we will be protesting together wearing wedding gowns at the Pennsylvania State House to really try to keep the momentum going and see if we can't get this bill over the the finish line there in the state of Pennsylvania. So that's the next stop. It seems like a lot of good stuff is happening in Pennsylvania for children to be protected. 
That is so true. We are almost across the finish line on a female genital mutilation bill there that we've been working on with Representative Mert since 2013. So it's a really good place to be a child right now. The politicians there are really, really thinking about what's impacting kids in the state and doing what they can to to protect them. I totally agree with you. Yeah. There's a there's a lot of great leadership in the state of Pennsylvania who are doing a lot of great things for kids. We're really excited about it. And I cannot tell you how excited I will be if the anti-female genital mutilation bill finally gets passed there. Representative Mert has been such a champion and he is has just not given up in the face of a lot of opposition over a really long time. And to see that bill pass will be a really big victory. And there are a lot of women and girls who are at risk of female genital mutilation in the state of Pennsylvania. So that's great news. That's awful. But it's good that you guys are on it. And why is Pennsylvania having this significant increase in good legislation? Is that the people showing up? Is it activism that's happening in the state? I think it's a combination of good leadership and activism. There is a lot of going door to door that is happening in Pennsylvania and organizations like the AHA Foundation and Unchained at Last, as well as local groups who are going and meeting with legislators and saying, this is an issue here and there's something that you can do to stop it, has been hugely important in helping legislators get over the learning curve of understanding that these issues are happening to people in my community and understanding that there are really simple legislative fixes that can take care of it. Do you think some of this, not grassroots, because I know AHA Foundation is is not grassroots, but this mobilizing of people going door to door, it would seem to me that it's also building your community back to being sort of a village that would sort of kind of semi take care of one another, because we kind of haven't been doing that for the past few decades. It really does feel like that, Lisa. It feels like, and and we typically are with local organizations when we're going door to door, and and it does feel like we're rallying together and really kind of making the political process what it was supposed to be in the first place, which is government representing the people. And this is us going to legislators and saying, this is what we need. This is how we need to protect our children. And then hearing us out and talking to us about their concerns, it's really, it's one of the most inspiring things and frustrating and, you know, want to pull my hair out things that I do at work is, <laughs> is going door to door talking to legislators. <laughs> Ding dong. <laughs> yeah. just, like, beat on the door extra hard at certain doors. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. But I have to say, I have been uh, really encouraged by the fact that a lot of legislators that I had not expected to hear what we had to say, to really take it seriously and, and not only agree with what we're talking about, but also become leaders in the issue. So I kind of had a stereotypical idea of who it was that was going to be fighting the good fight with us. And I've been pleasantly surprised that there have been diverse legislators working on these issues from both sides of the aisle. And that's something that we really need to see. And it's something that makes a lot of sense, obviously, because we're talking about protecting kids. We're not talking about something that is political or it shouldn't be political. No, it's nonpartisan. (laughs) It's totally nonpartisan. Yep. Can't we all get behind protecting kids? Well, hopefully there's a shift going on. I do hope that the revolution will be peaceful this time as we reboot ourselves back to democracy. <laughs> I hope so, too. I hope so, too. But it's strange it's, days. Yeah, strange days indeed, sister. But, you know, you going door to door and connecting like that, I'm sure, is is making great strides. And it does bring us together. And it's good that we see each other as humans so we can protect each other. That is so true. And that is that has been very encouraging to me is realizing how much I have in common with people who I wouldn't otherwise have felt like I, you know, if I, if I were looking at them online or watching a soundbite on television, I might not realize how much I have in common with, with some people who I've been pleasantly surprised to find a lot of common ground with. Yeah, that's always good. This could be a random question, but I was just wondering, Amanda Parker, if you were not the senior director at the AHA Foundation, what would you be doing? Oh, wow. If I weren't the senior director at the AHA Foundation, sometimes I think about running for office myself. But I don't know. I The other thought is possibly becoming an attorney. I see the ways that law can help the people that I see needing that sort of help. I'm really passionate about supporting women and girls. And so if I were to be a politician or an attorney, my focus in either of those areas would be 
to making sure that I'm supporting women and girls in the best way I possibly can. So I'm definitely in the right arena for what I'm passionate about. I have no designs on leaving anytime soon. So I think the foundation has stuck with me for as long as they're going to have me. Or until you get admitted to law school. (laughs) (laughs) Or then. Well, thank you so very much. And again, how do we reach out and get involved? Anybody listening who wants to take action on FGM or child marriage, where, where do they go? Please visit us at the ahafoundation.org. We have so much work to do and we can't do it alone and we need all of the support we can have and all of the voices that we can get. And so anything that you can do to support, whether it's writing your legislators or tweeting on social media or donating, we need your support. And you can do that by just going to the ahafoundation.org. Thanks, y'all, for listening. Please come back to next One Menace Wednesday. You can find me on my website, lisalandry.com. Shout out, Ari. I love you, little boo-boo.